Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Rob Neal, OBE. And I just wanted to start by saying that Rob is the first OBE, but hopefully not the last, that I have had on my podcast. He's the co-founder of Crystal Alliance, which is a consultancy dedicated to helping organisations be more inclusive. He brings to that role 38 years of working for the UK Civil Service, where he played a pivotal role in bringing ethnicity and race to the forefront of people's minds through his involvement in employee networks and as the leader of Project Race at the MOJ. Welcome, Rob. Really, really excited to have you here today. Uh, It's lovely to see you. Um, And I thought we could just make a start by you could tell us, for those who don't know you, which is probably not very many of my listeners, uh, tell uh, tell us a bit about who you are and what it is that you do. Oh, well, firstly, thanks uh, for having me, Melody. Um, it's a joy to be here. Um, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts in, in, I guess, this series and thoroughly enjoyed them. So thanks for having me on. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name's Rob, Rob Neal. Uh, I'm a former civil servant. Um, when I look back at that, it's um, it, I totted up a total of 38 years. I, I have to pinch myself when I, when I say the digits. Um, but right now, I'm a um, I'm the founding director at Crystal Alliance. That's Crystal with a K. Um, do hop on, listeners, at, on our website. Lots of free and accessible information there. That's Crystal Alliance, no spaces. dot co. dot uk. Yeah, and I'll um, add that in the show notes so people could just click straight on it. Brilliant, brilliant, and uh, ostensibly what we are. Uh, and it does say this on the website, we're a group of friends, really, that kind of clicked and stayed in touch and and wanted to do something together. We weren't all together, sure. Uh, and in a sense, our strap line at, at Crystal Alliance does bear that out. Involve to evolve is is our strap line. And, um, and even that has evolved because it wasn't the original strap line. <laughs> but um, we are a group of friends, um, somewhat experienced. We're talking all of us into double digits of working uh, in either the public, private, or voluntary sector, some of us more than one, around this thing that's now called EDI in a lot of places, but equality, diversity, and inclusion, and really supporting uh, organizations, uh, small, uh, micro, uh, medium, and large organizations that will let us in through their front door, sometimes the back door, to actually do <laughs> work in supporting them to deliver on their um ambition to be more inclusive in in what they do and what they offer perfect thanks rob and we'll come back to that you can tell us a bit more about some of those things uh, towards the end but let's leap back in time you said you'd worked for the civil service for 38 years which is mm. amazing um, um, yeah big leap and i met you when you were working for the civil service but maybe you could start um and tell us a bit about how you even got got into the civil service in the first first place what made you want to work there how did you even get a job there sure um the civil service was actually a, a second choice as a career my my, <laughs> my initial choice um my first um realistic choice was was to become a police officer i say realistic because um I, even now i could still see myself playing some kind of role in that establishment, as, as challenging as I, I know it must be, um, I know a few police officers, and and I I know that that could have been a fit for me. But um, my very first ambition was to be a professional footballer, um, and but I realised relatively early on, including my school days, that whilst I love the game and continue to love the game, um, I was never going to be good enough to be a professional footballer. I was never going to earn my living at it. So I carried on playing a while. Um, competitively after leaving school, but but I I, I moved from my Saturday job, which was uh, in retail in a shoe shop in Kilburn, uh, called Curtis. They're no longer around, but part of the British Shoe Corporation. I, I turned from that job um, 
to the civil service after um, acknowledging that my, uh, my partner at the time, uh, to become my wife later on, uh, refused to endorse my, my application, my ambition to be a police officer. She, she feared I might not come home of an evening or indeed mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we very much wanted to make decisions together at that time in our journey. And so I looked up the next best thing and it seemed to be working in the civil service, meeting the needs of, of people in the community, um, but working close to law and so I applied to what was then the Lord Chancellor's Department, uh, later to become the Department of Constitutional Affairs, and even later than that to become what we now know today as the Ministry of Justice. Okay, perfect. Um, um, you know, you you when we spoke before, you told me a little bit about that experience of applying for the civil service. You know, how did you find? You know, it can be quite a long process sometimes. Lots of interviews. How did you find that process? Well, I kind of, um, the industry of it and the kind of um, protocol of it, I, I kind of had gotten used to in so much as I, I remember quite well that I, I'd made quite a lot of applications to different places under that umbrella called the civil service. Um, back in the day, we're talking the early 80s, recruitment was centralised. You had to go off to, I think it was Charles House, somewhere in the middle of London, um, and whilst I, I don't sit sit here or I don't speak with you as anyone who professes to be an expert geographically, in fact, geography I was rubbish at, at school, <laughs> I do know that, that London's a vast place. I do know that there's lots of um, sort of weight to it and lots of, you know, it's almost a labyrinth in itself. So uh, both viscerally uh, in terms of travelling for interviews and filling in the paperwork, I kind of, I didn't know it at the time, Melody, but... I, I was kind of uh, being prepared for what was to come. You know, lots of uh, form filling, um, lots of process, lots of requirement and qualifications required. Um, not necessarily at an advanced level so much, but but lots of it, volume wise. So the process wasn't wasn't anything that phased me, um, but because I, I knew it was coming. But that doesn't mean that I didn't grow tired of some of it at, at times and, and wish it could be streamlined. And that was later on to become an impetus for some of the work I would do in, in transformation. Mm. And I remember you telling me about um, a story, but you were talking about my mate Trev. Is that something <laughs> that you were said during your interview? Is that uh, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I was told later on after I'd um, been given the green light and, and been told to start, in fact, start that, that very next day after the interview, I was asked to wait outside the waiting room after the interview. Then I was called back in. I, then I was told, you know, almost at odds with some of this process that I was referring to. I, I was, I think they were desperate. I think they needed people straight away. But, but my interview was, I, I don't know if I would describe it as a shambles, but it was definitely weighted in favor of speaking of others. And in particular, my very close friend at that time, who also ended up joining the civil service, uh, working specifically and directly for the administration around the police, actually, and forged a, a, a three decade plus career in that space. Um, his name is Trevor. Uh, I, I refer to him lovingly as Trev. And we were we were joined at the hip somewhat from from sixth form in school, out of school into our football um, ambition. Um, and we we played together, we worked at things together and we we had a regard and a respect and indeed a love for each other that always had each other's name on the tip of our tongues. We liked the same sort of music. We hung out um, in all our discretionary time together. We went shopping and parties and raves and all that kind of stuff. So unbeknown to me, I was mentioning his name so much in the interview that <laughs> it, it, became, it became quite endearing to, um, I was interviewed by a two member panel, uh, both women, I can see them vividly now, um, and um, Alison and Julie, uh, and and they later on, about a fortnight later, as I recall, both walk, working in that same office, they said to me, Rob, your interview was hilarious. <laughs> and I said, why? And they said, because you kept on talking about Shrem. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought it was we thought it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sometimes I think because of the process, uh, candidates may end up, whether reluctantly or otherwise, talking a lot about themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've got a bit of a reputation for being able to do that at times, uh, i.e. talk about myself. But on this occasion, for whatever reason, I was talking a lot about Trev. <laughs> and what did your family think of you uh, going into the civil service? Is that, uh, you know, is it considered to be a good, solid career move? Absolutely. Yeah. My mum uh, in particular, my mum thought it was the best thing uh, I could ever have done. Uh, she was a little bit confused by it. Uh, me joining the Lord Chancellor Department and the local county court, it so happened, civil law, Wilsdon County Court. Uh, literally about uh, almost a thousand yards uh, from from where I was living with with mum at the time uh, she she concluded that I would one day become a judge <laughs> she she felt that as long as I worked hard kept my head down you know offered my best um uh, delivered my best then um then I would one day sit as a as a as a circuit judge um and I, I did try explaining on a number of occasions uh, but she always interpreted my explanation as me having a lack of ambition. She, <laughs> she, she would often, even in my presence, tell brothers, cousins, my aunts, uncles, um, that she she felt that I lacked ambition because I kept on telling her I wouldn't become a judge. Um, and one of the ironies in this in this journey of mine is that my my eldest child now. Um, my daughter, who, Rianne, who's 30, she she actually joined the civil service two weeks after I left. She uh, she is today a prosecuting lawyer working at the Crown Prosecution Service. <laughs> so she's living out your mum's fantasy, even, out, even yeah. if you weren't. Even if I'm not. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> That's good of her. Yeah. OK, brilliant. So let's let's take a jump because, uh, you know, we've we've got quite a lot of uh, career to cover, really. Mm -hmm. And um, let's jump what maybe 10 years uh for when you've been you know the civil service has quite a uh you know a, a, a promotion process that's maybe yeah. a little bit different to uh, other organizations and you'd not necessarily been successful a couple of times mm. do you want to talk a bit about that and and what happened during that time sure well it, it kind of spans um at least at least two-thirds of my career in terms of putting myself up and forward for um promotion uh, usually in the shape and form of a, of a dream role, certainly for me, um, I don't ever recall. I, I had a total of seven interviews during my career um, and I failed three of them and, and succeeded at four of them. Um, and I literally failed the, the first three that I went for. Mm -hmm. um, um, and looking back, I mean, this is all with, with hindsight. Um, as, as, as Zadie Smith says in her wonderful book, White Teeth, hindsight is always in 2020 vision. Um, I can see clearly why some of, at least a couple of those uh, failures um, came about. Um, I can see how I was able to successfully um, uh, take on some of those interviews later on in my career, certainly the second half of my career. But in, in answer to your question, um, the, the process was very much about, certainly early on, there has been an evolution in the process, but early on, it was about you acquiring the required uh, markings in your uh, annual appraisal. Um, really, uh, all of that down to your line manager. Your line manager, A, marking you fitted for promotion, so capable of working at the higher level, mm -hmm. um, and you declaring your... Uh, ambition to work at the higher level that, that you needed both um, and if you got both you could then uh, put your name uh, apply for a, for a job um, at the higher level wherever that may be within the same office or indeed elsewhere they were advertised internally quite quite well and then it, it, upon reading of your application if you were what's called sifted in you then got called for an interview now that didn't necessarily mean that you would get the job you were going for if you pass the mark you might sometimes end up what was called pull a ticket you would be in a queue to get a job at that level somewhere else but you were deemed ready for the next so some, almost like a badge that you're yeah. ready and then you yeah. maybe wait until yeah. there's appropriate roles absolutely and, and my my first interview came after bang on 10 years uh in the in the civil service I'd applied a couple of years before, 
um, for, for one or two posts um, and consecutive years, but, but was deemed not ready for that next level by my, my line manager or line managers at the time. So once you didn't get that green light, you couldn't, you, 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 you literally technically couldn't go, at that time, you couldn't go for, for a job. That has changed now, thankfully. Mm. You don't, it's a lot of power for the line manager. A lot of power, and and we begin, or at least I was then introduced to some of the, um, the you know the the rules of work, as it were, but the kind of the hurdles that there were, and the kind of door that was opened for bias and 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 indeed discrimination to enter into people's uh, to have an impact on people's career and career trajectory, and um. You know, later on, it was to be revealed, Melody, that there was disproportionate uh, marking going on, disparity, which could only be put down to some of the differences between those that had held managerial positions and those that were in sort of team member or job um, job holder positions. And mm. it was it was something that was to um, instigate the the change of that process because it was accepted that there was disproportionality in the way in which appraisal markings were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you you applied a few times um, and then um, Elaine Gibson uh, was quite important, you said, in, in, in supporting you. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Well, she was hugely important. Um, I'm convinced she was, um, I, I happened to walk in faith, so I'm going to refer to her as an angel because she certainly kept my career on track she certainly kept me at one point in the civil service um, for for good or bad. Uh, it's all down to Elaine Gibson at, at this point. Some others have played similar roles along the way, but Elaine was 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 fundamental at a point in my career where I had, for that third time, uh, failed an interview for the next level. Um, I was pretty low um, emotionally. I was pretty low in, in morale. I. I I literally couldn't understand what I was doing. I'm going to say the word wrong, but what I was not doing in order to get to that next level. And Elaine um, was there for me. She was um, a great listener. I say was, I'm sure wherever she is now, she's a great listener. We're not in touch directly, but um, I know that she was a great listener to me. Uh, and I, I happen to know she, she played a similar role for others. She was a designated and um, full-time career officer so she was honing her skills as she as she traveled uh, we don't uh, or rather the civil service don't have designated or um, uh, full-time career officers anymore interestingly but that was her job uh, and she was very good at it and she certainly kept me on board um, to to then go on to serve what would be another 20 25, 26, 27 years almost uh, by the time I, um, I, I I let go of my beloved civil service. But she was hugely significant and I will forever be in her debt for the role she played in keeping me on track at that time. Mm. And what kind of things did she do? Did she give you advice? What, what was help, particularly helpful about what she, well, she did? A lot of the, she did. I suppose... I suppose, Melody, she did a lot of the classic things looking back. Again, it's this this hindsight thing. I mean, I was I was I was not in a great place at the time, but she was she was a she was a great listener. She would she had a way of encouraging you to put words to how you were feeling, but in your own time. You know, she wasn't she 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 wasn't rushing you. She wasn't you know she wasn't all over. You know, it wasn't it wasn't so cliched that you know you could have read a book about it or. Or, or listened, you know, back then there weren't podcasts, but but listened to a radio program or a, or, or have it delivered on on a on a TV or a monitor. Uh, she was very human about it. She was very compassionate. Um, she almost felt what I felt. So she was, I guess, the word is empath empathic. She was very empathetic towards me, but she was also great at getting you to look at perspective and. Um, and a believer in my ability, you know, she, it helped that she at times had worked alongside me. So she knew um, that it was down to, uh, or she was very clear that this was down to the process. It was about me getting my head around the process. And, and whilst there might be something in my performance at interview that, that needed and could be improved, my actual innate ability to do the work at that next level was in her mind, not even under question. 
Mm -hmm. You can work at that next level, Rob. I've been around long enough to know. I've seen you work. Um, don't forget that. It's about you getting through the process. And she was very good at that, Melody. She was absolutely brilliant at doing that. Great. And as a result of that, you did then get promoted. You were successful on your fourth attempt. On my fourth attempt. <laughs> you know, there, there was still a part of me that thinks that that they thought, well, it keeps on coming. We're gonna. <laughs> You're exhausted, that. though. <laughs> I'm, I, to this day, I'm not convinced that my fourth interview was any better mm. than my certainly my third. Um, it may well have been better than my first one, I accept. Mm -hmm. But but my second and third, I'm not sure there was much discernible difference. But, but you know, I, I had a panel that that seemed to to grab a hold of what I had to say. I'd been coached heavily by Elaine. Um, and uh, and that was again hugely significant. Um, and uh, uh, you know the euphoria that followed when I got that letter to say that uh, you knew by the first three words, by the way, because or, or the third word, because the third word was either sorry or pleased. So I'm either <laughs> I'm sorry to inform you or I am pleased to inform you. Uh -huh. And I got the pleased on my third word, and I was. Um, I, you know, it was party time and um, Elaine wasn't going to escape my my gratitude. So um, that was great. It was right. a great feeling. I'm feeling yeah. some of that. It's Lovely. Um, and I know when we've talked previously, uh, we both talked about the, that paper, the Navigating the Labyrinth. I think, yeah. you know, civil service is quite complex yeah. um, in terms of progression. And uh, there's a lot of sort of um unwritten rules and mm -hmm. uh ways of progressing that are um uh that people are just not necessarily aware of but that paper navigating the labyrinth even though it's written specifically around um social mobility to me just is it's worth everybody uh reading because it's it's really helpful in terms of understanding how for instance taking different types of roles can be incredibly um, helpful to your career and and even actually I think for people outside of the civil service just understanding that there are ways of progressing and types of experiences that are worth gaining um <clears throat> just a really helpful and well written I think uh paper oh it's it's it's, it's for me it's a, a powerful paper it's um it's uh, perhaps for some revelatory for those of us that have worked in the system and have been looking at the system um it's uh it, it's it's spot on it's authentic it's true it's well informed it's um all of those things for sure uh, i think there's at least a series of yes minister in that paper somewhere <laughs> or the thick of it or whichever of those you want to pull on uh, because you know life imitating art or is it the other way around it's it's all on the money um and some of it um is not just uncomfortable um but some of it's quite painful uh mm -hmm. to to read and to uh put into uh context and to actually connect with as either a you know a victim of uh, as as certainly i have been uh, and not just me where swathes of other people who um end up responding to what it is they experience and face in the in the, in the workplace that is the civil service um you know I, I joined the civil service um for a number of reasons uh, i've touched on and one of those in this podcast but but part of it was about my calling to serve part of it was about meeting the needs of people from I guess my community as as a priority, but alongside other members of the community as well. But a, a kind of even before the language we now use, but really having a sense of you know including everybody. And what navigating the labyrinth shines a light on is that um, a lot of the practices, policies, and procedures that have become tradition in the civil service um, don't do that. In fact. Uh, they just it's not just that they don't do that they actually um, at times deliberately do the opposite they exclude um, and it's a conscious exclusion um, and as someone that uh, loves the civil service that has a real clear thought about what the civil service is there to do having worked in it for 38 years 
I don't say that lightly. I don't say that uh, with any smile on my face. I say that because of my experience and the experience of others that I have uh, worked alongside and indeed others that I've supported. And so the institutional isms that afflict the civil service are wound up in and are, are perpetuated and maintained by those policies, those practices and procedures. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be uh, addressed more. It's something that needs to be worked at and it needs to be worked at by people who have a frame of reference that is capable of working at all of it. Um, and that, you know, is something that, that is still on my agenda, even from the position I now occupy, which is outside of the mm -hmm. machine. Mm -hmm. but still working at times with it. Mm. Well, that, I think that leads us really nicely on to the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is, um, you know, in the MOJ, the Black Staff Network that you were heavily involved in setting up. So tell us a bit about that and how that came about and what you did. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a role that was offered to me, um, for, again, for a number of reasons. Um, and and ironically, it, the list of reasons ended with, well, it started with and ended with, and we're not asking you, Rob, because you're black. You know, <laughs> we're asking you, Rob, because you've worked on the what's called operational posts. Uh, I was working in the county court dealing with um, the customer facing. Um, we're asking you, Rob, because you've been a trainer and you're a qualified trainer. So you get what it takes to impart information and knowledge and and encourage people to offer their best at work. But we're asking you, Rob, because you've worked at headquarters office. Um, so in a sense, they were they were promoting the, the, the social capital that I'd built. They were promoting my connectivity. They were promoting uh, a, a bit of my personality in that I was uh, someone that could work across traditional lines. Um, and, and all of that, uh, he said immodestly, uh, is true. But they weren't um, uh, able, they weren't capable of acknowledging um, one of those reasons would, would be to do with my background and experience. They, they were clumsy around that. It was a clunky thought. So I had to think about it um, because I wasn't sure they were ready for what would come next. You see, Melody, I knew um, I could almost prophetically predict that, that this network, with the, certainly with the people I was going to uh, invite to get involved, and if they said yes was going to take off. Mm -hmm. it, 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 in many ways, Melody, the network already existed in a kind of subterranean form. Uh, black staff, indeed, a number of different groups that were underrepresented across the civil service already had networks that enabled them to get from day to day, <laughs> literally. We had our own A&E. We had our own triage to deal with racism, um, to deal with discrimination, and to, to work with, with people uh, and individuals who had faced this turbulence in the workplace. Um, and some of us were beginning to study uh, deeper uh, some of the, the wonderful uh, narratives available to us, some of the wonderful teachings from the likes of Franz Fanon, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, and others who had spoken about uh, critical race theory in the past, but even present day, um, uh, experts and subject matter experts like Dr. Nicola Rollock, um, who talks about critical race theory. So we were doing a lot of that kind of boot camp effort out of sight, uh, not for any other reason than it wasn't part of the currency of our work in the workplace. And now they were gonna, they were gonna sanction and finance and budget a staff network for black staff. And they were gonna ask me, and I was then going to invite others to lead that. Oh, some of us were like a kid in a sweet shop. And what was it that um, meant that that was the time that suddenly, um, you know, there was an interest in the the Black Staff Network? What I think that the single biggest catalyst was uh, the Lawrence Report. Mm -hmm. we, we are now at the, the end of the 90s. We're, we're stepping towards the noughties. And uh, the white paper um, that was produced... Um, that that document that, that that everyone has to read, certainly at a certain level, um, at the top of the civil service, 
um, was not just published, uh, but the um, the the incompetent investigation into uh, Stephen Lawrence's murder, um, which you know took a change of government to to be uh, commissioned, which took a change of political will to find uh, appropriate attention, but had produced through uh, the late William McPherson and his team um, a report that offered to the UK a definition of institutional racism. And so with the language, uh, and that's all important in the civil service, but with the language uh, uh, in the year 1999 and then the ensuing years, 20, uh, 2000 and 2001, uh, people like myself um, and, and were able to open the door into a, a room of conversation about institutional racism. We even went as far as explaining to those at the very top of the government departments that this isn't a brand new term. It, it, it's a term that, that has come from uh, the United States, introduced by Stokely Carmichael in 1968. We are catching up and uh, there are many lessons we can take from the US, uh, acknowledging that there are some differences, but we can accelerate our response to what's happened in the Metropolitan Police Force. And it's ironic that we should be having this podcast in a year where mm -hmm. uh, Casey has just revisited some of the um, institutional, um, not just racism, but misogyny, homophobia, and all of what goes on in with facts, with incidents. And yet we, we, we again, have this podcast at a time where the very uh, top of that leadership um, whilst accepting the findings of uh, the Casey review, uh, still has an issue um, and a form of denial around the term institutional racism um, and institutionally any form of discrimination. And I think, uh, and this is a personal view, Melody, um, and I think it is relevant to, to what it is we're trying to deliver and achieve here. There is a gap in the understanding of some of our senior leaders and indeed some of our elected officials, ministers and secretaries of state, there's a gap in the knowledge and understanding as to what institutional racism is. And that's the politest way I could put it. Some of that gap is through neglect and, and ignorance, but some of that gap is deliberate. They don't want to know what institutional racism means because they think that it will be interpreted as they personally being racist or individuals being racist. And whilst that might be true mm -hmm. of some, um, institutional racism is an altogether different dimension of racism and needs to be dealt with in a different way. And, and, and if you don't, uh, it's not one, you know, it's not a, a single rotten apple in the barrel as, as, as was highlighted by Lord Scarman in the early eighties. It's actually the barrel that's rotten. And so it's the barrel makers and the barrels themselves that need to be transformed. And that's the attention that's required. And that's what uh, Tony Sewell and his commissioners missed in the commissioned report into racial and ethnic disparities. That's what they missed. Mm. Yeah. And I'm sure you felt, I mean, it, there was just, I think, shock waves when, when you know, reports come out saying there's no, you know, institutional racism doesn't exist. And... Well, well I, I put just one caveat on that word shock, Melody, because um, I wasn't shocked when mm. I read those 143 pages. I wasn't shocked um, by um, the uh, description around the four overarching aims or indeed the 24 recommendations, um, some of which are on the money and very good. Let me say mm. that. But I wasn't shocked that Tony and um, the some of some of his because a couple of them have distanced themselves from the report, interestingly. But I wasn't shocked that a number of the commissioners uh, and Tony concluded that institutional racism was no longer an impact in the UK, and that all of us, regardless of our ethnicity or race, could get to where we wanted to or could maximise our potential by pulling up our bootstraps. I wasn't shocked by that narrative because I happened to have worked alongside Tony for a year at the Youth Justice Board. And I know some of Tony's politics, certainly enough of his politics to 
uh, not be shocked by that outcome. Right. Uh, with other factors at play. And I, I can accept that some people were shocked um, and I can accept that some people were shocked, uh, you know, uh, within the black community because there was a hope that we had when that report was commissioned. And so they're speaking from their uh, hope not fulfilled. But I personally wasn't shocked. I, I predicted it along with others. And, you know, we, we, we still have work to do because whilst it was an opportunity to shine a light on what really impacts um, us as, as a community, and by that I mean Black and Asian uh, and minority ethnic peoples, it was an opportunity that was missed, it was an opportunity that was dropped, and, and there were all sorts of reasons why that happened. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, you know, take you from having set up what would no doubt be one of the first um, black staff networks, probably mm -hmm. in the UK, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. There's still plenty of organisations that still don't have one over 20 years later. Um, you then moved into, well, you mentioned already, you, you know, you'd started in a, a, in a role where you were a trainer, but then you had an opportunity to go on loan, I think that was the right uh, terminology, yeah. to the USA. Do you want to um, say some more about that? Sure, certainly. And uh, just very quickly in passing, we were, I think, the third government department to launch a Black Staff Network. The very first was, in fact, um, uh, launched at the Cabinet Office. It was called COBAN. That mm -hmm. was the Cabinet Office Black and Asian Network called COBAN. A number of dear friends involved in that, including... Um, the wonderful Sandra Kerr, who does work at uh, business in the community mm -hmm. with Race for Opportunity and the Race at Work Charter. Um, the late Sharon Grant, uh, a, a, a phenomenal individual um, who uh, was part of the engine room in pulling that together and was later to join me and some others on the Civil Service Race Equality Network, which is like an umbrella race network, a kind of planet network. Mm -hmm of all the black staff that was coming together to form that wider social capital, over 6,000 members at our height. Um, and um, Selvin uh, Brown, who is now a member mm -hmm. of the senior civil service, working in the civil service to this day. And they were instigators of that very first uh, black staff network and mm -hmm. we followed some of their lead. Actually, and you've just made me think of something, Rob, before we jump on, because yeah. um, not everyone who's listening to this will have had any involvement in a staff network. They may, you know, you and I both work with staff networks. You know, we know that world. We know the importance of what they do. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, if someone who was not involved at all said to you, why even have a staff network? What do they do? What What's the purpose? Mm. What would you say? Well, I, I think uh, I think that staff networks are um, intrinsic owners of issues that, for a, a variety of reasons, those that are in positions of power and leadership in an organisation might otherwise miss. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, I think that staff networks, where they form, and they nearly always form not upon... Um, request or prescription, but they form organically um, because of a gap in the provision and service for those members, for those often underrepresented groups. So, for example, if you're talking about a black staff network and you look at the corporate board, the executive board, um, and you you see literally upon site that that there are no uh, there there is no representation on that board. Um, there's no voice necessarily that can speak on your behalf or from that perspective. Uh, the same reads for gender, the same may read for disability. I appreciate that some disabilities are invisible, so you can't always be certain of that. Uh, they may read the same for LGBTQ plus community. But, but on that logic alone, uh, and I know there's more to that uh, argument, more to that narrative, but, but on that logic alone about having a reflective workforce at all levels, and I like to use the phrase, in decision-making spaces. They don't come more decision-making than an executive board, but there are other decision-making spaces. What we're looking for is a reflective workforce, a, 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 a workforce that can reflect the communities that we serve. And certainly in my experience and throughout my career, and I would argue to the present day, um, we're not 
hitting those targets, if I may put it that way, we're not reflecting those that we serve. And so what, what staff networks can offer any organization is a, a space and a, a safe space almost automatically. Um, not saying you don't have to work at it like you do in all safe spaces, but, but it kind of gets a, a bit of a head start on a safe space for um, intrinsic owners of the issue to come together, to shout and holler, to advocate and uh, to actively um, increase the volume around their lived experience in the organization. And uh, I like to reach for the phrase, uh, and Melody, I'm, I know it's the one you're familiar with, but, but some of our listeners may want to uh, make a note and, and catch up with it. And that is around being a tempered radical. Mm -hmm. It's about knowing that with your love for the organization you're working so hard in, it is that that gives you permission to be critical of it. That your love of the organization, your compassion for the organization, your commitment and belonging in the organization, wherever that may be at, is what gives you license to say, look, we're not doing this right. We can do this better. Have we got the right people in the room? How can we attract the difference? How can we promote, encourage, inspire the difference to be all that they can be in this organization? And staff networks, uh, you know, ostensibly at the heart of its work and operation is a space for tempered radicals to move in, to, 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 to make it a, a home and to keep connected with their ambition, which is to make the organization they're in a better one. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. So let's jump to the US. Mm. How did you end up going out there? What what happened? What did you learn? Who did you meet? Wow. Well, this is a, <laughs> it, it's a, a nothing nothing other than a, a, a kind of a, almost a fantasy come true, but a dream phase in my career. Um, and what happened was having bumped into um, a, a, a racist line manager, and I say that again not lightly, but because of my experience, because of what was said to me and what was done around me and my career at the time, I was uh, in a conversation with the HR director uh, who uh, was um, uh, encouraging uh, around my career and had, had seen some of the effective work that I delivered uh, with a team behind me, but, but, but was a supporter of what I was trying to do, a supporter of my tempered radicalism. And they felt it would be um, useful for me to work somewhere else for a season to collect myself to collect my ambitions and and on a day in the future return there wasn't any fixed period to it uh, initially but uh, she felt that that would be the best way forward given uh, the almost impasse uh, so certainly antlers locked with a very senior member of the department that I was involved with now I was I was a lot younger then I guess certainly in my understanding of what was going on and looking back I could have taken a couple of options to really um, reach for the rule book and, and and bring some people to to task around what was going on but I I took the option that was um, um, more supportive of, of me offering my best in the in the working space and I was was taken up with a loan effectively working outside the sector but still retaining my civil service terms uh, a lot of people were doing that at that time. Some of it yeah, as a forethought. I was, mine was a reaction to a situation. And I went to work at what was uh, then called the 1990 Trust, which um, was a uh, civil rights, sorry, sorry, a human rights and race equality organization. A human rights and uh, uh, race equality organization. And leading that up at the time was a Karen Chowan. Um, uh, just phenomenal uh, teacher, uh, a phenomenal uh, civil rights and human rights expert in her own right. And she was um, uh, running uh, an, uh, an, a project that would look at um, learning from the agenda in the United States around delivering on civil rights. And that included uh, a trip out to uh, Chicago, USA, and working with the uh, Push Rainbow uh, Network, 
uh, that was led by none other than the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Wow. And so we got up close and personal with the Reverend um, uh, and a thought goes out to him uh, right now. He's not in the best of health and um, uh, he's uh, more confined than he would ever want to be as uh, an activist that he is and a firebrand orator that he is. So we don't see much of him these days. But um, with him and his team, we were kind of, ex we were introduced to some of their strategies and thinking. Um, and we were then able to set up a wonderful project, which was entitled Equinomics Melody. It, it didn't take off for a number of reasons, um, but it did exist for a year, uh, uh, or just over a year actually, um, with the wonderful Whitney Isles and others working on that. And um, I was a part of that uh, team. And we brought the Reverend Jesse Jackson to the UK. We went to nine cities in seven days. And we talked about the relationship between economics and race equality. And we um, worked with a number of leading voices around um, shining a light on that relationship to kind of move us forward in the uh, work that was needed, not just in the public sector and therefore the services that the public sector provide, but also in the private sector as well. And so we hit Leicester, Liverpool, we went to Cardiff, we went uh, to I think three locations in London, um, we went to Birmingham, Glasgow, um, I think I'm just about on certainly the nine that we did in seven days there and um, it was a it was a wonderful experience. It was fast and furious. I learned so much uh, and worked with some powerhouses, including the likes of uh, Lord Woolley. That's um, uh, Sir Simon Woolley, mm -hmm. who now uh, works as a uh, vice chancellor at uh, Homerton out of Cambridge. Um, Lee Jasper, um, for many controversial, but but a, a, a firebrand uh, orator and a wonderful just a wonderful exponent of race equality across the uk and former advisor to uh the mayor of london when it was ken livingston and a thought to him at this point as he's not well um, and others and others in that period so it was just a, a wonderful schooling for me one that i'm still continuing to to learn from i was able to work with others melody to to write some stuff i i was uh, i always had a an anchor back at the civil service i guess um, and I knew I'd be back there one day and it was slightly longer than I thought it would be. It was originally mapped out once we'd gone past the green light to go, but it was mapped out in paper as a year, but it became two and a half years and I loved every single second of it. What you said you learned a lot and you've mentioned a, a number of uh, firebrand orators is the phrase you use. And I've seen you speak on a stage and you have and a real intensity and passion in the way that you speak. Did you have that before? Did Is that something you learned from them? I'm curious. Well, first of all, thank you very much to um, to say that. Um, I know it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but it certainly lands as a, as a compliment for me. So thank you. Um, it's something that I've always um, uh, reached for. It's something that I've always um, uh, played with. Um, in terms of uh, an audience and saying something that will move them, uh, saying something that will inspire them and empower them. So I guess it's always something that I've reached for. Um, uh, the, the, the modest part of me, and, and that's, that's not the greater part, but the modest part of me says it's down to the audience to decide whether it lands in that way. But that's certainly something that I've always aimed for. I've, I've, I've read the works of Martin Luther King Jr. I've always been inspired by his oratory, but I, long before I met the Reverend Jesse Jackson, I, I always warmed to what he had to do and say. More recently, of course, President Barack Obama, um, but, but others who have spoken powerfully uh, on uh, the stage, um, Mayor Angelou. Um, uh, I went to watch... Um, um the recently but the uh, dr robin d'angelo um who wrote her book uh, white um fragility mm -hmm. uh, she she uh, speaks powerfully um 
but a, but a number of, of people fit the, the category for me. And I, I kind of um, connect with them readily and quite easily and aspire to speak in a way that will empower and inspire people to do what they've got to do uh, after after any of the sessions that I deliver. Great, thank you. Let's um, go back to the civil service mm -hmm. um, and uh, Project Race, mm -hmm. which you were involved in. Was that 2018? Is that right? That right, yeah. May mm -hmm. of that year, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about Project Race. Well, Project Race came about um, really out of a, uh, a, a, a a kind of a, almost a rejection of the of the Black Staff Network, um, because uh, the Black Staff Network had, through peaks and troughs, uh, but proud as we were called, people from diverse racial origins united in the department, had had, uh, as I say, peaked and troughed uh, through a period of time since its uh, launch back in two thousand and one, um, and for all sorts of reasons, um, there was a uh, uh, an insistence that all networks be leveled off and be treated the same. For those of us who were working on the Proud Staff Network, we didn't think that was uh, appropriate. We didn't. We thought that was clumsy at best. But we thought it was actually um, insensitive to the priority around race and race equality. We're not saying that the other uh, inequalities didn't exist. We're just saying that the impact of them wasn't as great. And so there needed to be some more intelligence, more data, more um, thought into allocation of resources uh, and um, access to decision-making spaces. So in response to, um, and it, over a period of time, we didn't just immediately move to Project Raise. We, we thought, uh, and by we, I mean the people that were, many of whom were working on the network at the time, the, the Proud Network, felt that there was a need to move to another position where we could uh, be um, um, acknowledged as part of the governance structure, um, that we could be part of the business planning cycle, that we could, uh, with, with our work and effort, which remained high level and hard, produce the empirical evidence, mix it with the anecdotal stuff, those personal stories. And I love what Brené Brown has to say about uh, personal stories. She's saying, Personal stories are data, but they're data with a soul. Mm. So that's what we set about doing. Thank you, Brené. But we said, look, we can't leave out, the, obviously, the number crunching that goes on, the scores on the doors, the empirical stuff. A lot of people are persuaded by that, and particularly in the civil service, and that's not a criticism. That's absolutely necessary. But nor should we leave out the anecdotal stuff, the lived experience, the personal stories that personal data, the data with a soul, because traditionally the civil service ain't been good at soul and working with soulful stories. So we, we decided that uh, as an approach, what if we came up with a, a, a formalized project that looked at delivering on racial equity, that looked at um, delivering a reflective workforce in terms of race and ethnicity. Wouldn't that be a thing? And we got together with some like-spirited, like-minded people at all levels. And uh, we got into a room and we had a good old thrash out about it uh, across a two-day uh, agenda. And um, after work with the internal comms team, where we went into the room, Melody, with the race project for what was then the DCA, Department of Constitution Affairs, um, we came out of the room, uh, not with the race project for DCA, but with project race for the DCA. Some felt it sounded more like a mission that we were going to move from here on a journey. And so that was uh, what internal comms helped us to rename and rebrand. But uh, a member of the SCS, uh, my dear friend, uh, Alison, Alison Wedge, she actually came up with our strap line, which was big, bold brave um, and we all loved it instantly big bold and brave was project race and we set about our work with the endorsement of the permanent secretary then Richard Heaton later to become Sir Richard Heaton who's now just um, signed up after a period uh, of absence from the civil service he's just returned to lead the art collection for the civil service that's his post always a lover of art was Richard 
but he endorsed Project Race and we set about our work. Um, tell me a bit about, you know, what kind of uh, outcomes did you achieve? What, you know, how do you feel about it now looking back on it, you know, a few years later? Well, I, I feel, uh, ironically, <laughs> uh, don't want to sound cliche, I, I, I feel proud about it, actually. We, we lasted about two years, just short of. We had three full-time staff, myself, um, uh, the wonderful uh, Yvonne Dowie, who still remains in the civil service, um, uh, and she's uh, plugging away at the same sorts of issues and some, and also still in the civil service, the uh, the engine room of our effort, Alpa, or rather RT, I'd worked with an Alpa previously, uh, also playing a similar role with the Proud Network, Alpa Patel, who's now left the civil service, but RT Patel, um, who's still in the civil service, was uh, our engine room, and she kept us honest around all of the, the financial uh, and governance structures. She was just a brilliant individual working on the kind of administration. But I feel proud about Project Race because we did a number of things. We increased applications from the black community for uh, job promotions, for job elevation, and some of those were successful, and we increased those. We, inc we closed the gap um, between white and black staff in terms of diversity um, diversity uh, data. Um, there was there was a at the time an eighty four percent return from white staff when declaring their diversity details. A, a healthy figure uh, across most departments, but but one with a little bit more room for improvement and one that they were working on uh, from HR to all staff. But the same readout for black. Asian and minority ethnic staff fell, uh, had fallen to 73%, some 11% lower. Uh, these figures I'll never forget because what we did in 12 months was we supported and ran a campaign to, um, to increase the response rate amongst the Black, Asian and minority ethnic community. You know, we ran workshops, we spoke to individuals, why it's important to declare your diversity data. We get it that the department, in your view, has let you down but we are now looking to take a run up to offering your best and making sure that you maximize your potential. Um, you say we did, um, uh, your view counts. We can't provide for all of the population unless we know where all of the population is. And so in 12 months, we went from 73% to 86% on that response rate, out uh, stripping uh, the white population actually for the first time, certainly in my history to that point, and we were able to make decisions based on that data. And so we did a lot along that journey, increasing the understanding and awareness of uh, and, and importance of empirical data to uh, our members, uh, because the relationship between Project Race, Melody, and the Proud Staff Network was maintained. It wasn't either or, it was mm -hmm. both and. Okay. So we worked in collaboration um, and alongside us, uh, as mentioned uh, names previously, but um, uh, the wonderful Olivia Ebanks uh, uh, and uh, Aon Swinton became um, uh, chairs of the Proud Staff Network consecutively and mm -hmm. the relationship was maintained. So it was so important to keep those working together in partnership and that's what we did. Mm. Let's just, um, we haven't got much time and I just want to make sure that we just capture um, you know, what caused you to finally leave the civil service? You 38 years mm. and you've left and set up Crystal Alliance. What, why, why, you know, why at that time did you choose to, to go and do something else? Well, as, as with, with something of that magnitude, I guess, for, for, for most of us who, who have been in that position, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, an easy decision. It wasn't a decision I took lightly. But it was one that felt inevitable, uh, if, 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 if I, I can offer that, what might appear for some contradiction. Um, the biggest single thing was, was what I saw coming down the track. Uh, when I look at things like Windrush Melody um, and the way that that was handled, you know, my heart aches, not just as someone uh, of Jamaican heritage, um, both both my parents are from the island of Jamaica. My dad no longer with us, sadly. He passed away in 2018, um, coming up five years this uh, year, November actually, November the 21st, dad left us. But 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 both my parents, dad in uh, 
in, in 1960, mum in 1963, came to uh, the UK from uh, the island of Jamaica. Uh, dad is a carpenter, my mum is a nurse, to um, work hard, that's all they knew, uh, to send home what they could and to return home, actually, uh, was their uh, original uh, plan. Um, but I came around in 64, my brother followed in um, late 65, so quite quickly mum had two young, uh, well, babies, um, and both in nappies at the time. And, and so she changed her, her plan, she pivoted. Um, Dad uh, was able to stick around for long enough to also change some of his plans. Um, but I couldn't help but be impacted. And, and, and as I know a number of people, not just from the Caribbean community, but also uh, beyond the Caribbean community, um, lots of relationships and unions had formed. And so when Windrush came about and the way in which Windrush was handled and its policy about uh, you know, having individuals, uh, uh, in some cases, forcibly returned to a land that they were totally unfamiliar with, that made the UK their home, some of them 40, 50 years plus. Um, I, I just couldn't understand and I felt ashamed to be a civil servant responsible for such a policy and it added to the weight I was feeling about the direction of travel for uh, the, the complexion of this uh, government and indeed the current government and so um, I, I felt I needed to make a decision about that I felt I, I, I needed to um, um, whilst there was still strength in my body and I still had an idea or two about how I could help organizations be more inclusive I, I, I felt I needed to do something um, that would uh, help me fulfill that ambition. And I looked at my uh, tenure. I'd certainly given it a good go. Uh, I'd sign up to the whole tempered radicalism um, badge, and I'd certainly given it as much as I could from within the machine uh, that is Whitehall and indeed the wider civil service. And um, I felt that my best efforts would be uh, now outside of that and looking to work with others, both inside and outside, to help organisations be more inclusive. And so Crystal Alliance was born. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to finish off by asking you a couple of uh, questions that I ask all my guests, uh, one of which is what advice would you give to your younger self? There's a few, thing that pop, a few things that pop into my mind. I think if I was speaking to the younger me, I would want to, I'd probably have to think about the right words because all sorts of things have happened to me as I've traveled, but I'd want to say to Rob, you don't have to have, and you, know, you, don't, you certainly don't have to seek white validation. Mm. The, 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 I mean, this came to me really late in my career, the second half of my career, uh, you know, uh, for, for the first decade, I really, 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 and I think a part of me will always believe in meritocracy and that all I needed to do to maximise my potential was to offer my best, deliver my best, and to um, outperform any of my friends or colleagues that were competing against me for a post or a way of thinking or a way of doing something. And I realised about 10 years in, it took me another five or six years to really do anything about it, I guess, but that actually meritocracy has become a myth. It's, it's, not, it's not true, sadly. Again, I say this with an aching heart. I wish it was true, but the, the evidence is overwhelming. Something else was going on. And, it, and in, sadly, in some spaces, in some parts of some departments, it's still going on. Nepotistic practices, the labyrinth, the need to know, the pronounced, uh, you know, the received pronunciation, all of that, you know, the Radio 2, the Golf Club, all of that stuff, Melody, is still going on, sadly. And so I would say to my younger self, you don't have to seek white validation. Thank you. I hear that. Um, my second question is around a strapline or a title for your story. Oh. There we are. I, I sign off my emails, stay strong, which is um, a bit cliched, a bit Tom Robbins, I guess. But it is about, you know, whatever happens, whatever comes your way, stay strong because tomorrow is on its way 
and your pathway to offering your best is always with you. Um, and so stay strong comes to mind. But I kind of like what we've got at Crystal Alliance, the involve to evolve, that actually our best future is available to us if we can involve more of our people and hear from more of them about how we need to do our work around here. What is the culture we're, we're seeking to uh, take on? And I think involve to evolve is a way of saying that. Lovely. Thank you. And final question is um i'm going to be putting this episode out during black history month which is uh, october and i'm just curious on your thoughts about black history month and what advice would you give to people who maybe want to be more involved or to understand more you know i just want to hear your thoughts really sure well, do you know i've um again this is uh, my view on black history month has evolved over the years um, I've always enjoyed a focused attention on things uh, that have uh, impacted across the world, both historically and in the present day, whether it's, you know, parts of the mobile phone, traffic lights, you know, uh, blood transfusion, all of the kind of almost somewhat more well-known uh, facts, even though they may have started out as lesser known facts about the contribution of the African diaspora contribution of black people across the world. Um, I do sometimes respond to questions of this type, Melody, by saying I'm black every day and every <laughs> month is Black History Month. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 I, and there is a strong argument and I have a lot of sympathy with the argument. But, you know, I like uh, and welcome the attention to uh, black history that October in this part of the world provides. It's January in the US. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something of an opportunity to really turn up uh, the volume to increase uh, the, the brightness, if not whack up the contrast on contributions. I love this year's theme, uh, which is being led by the wonderful Sharon Inkotaria, author of, ironically, the um, incredible power of staff networks, by the way, and the leader of that group, the National Day for Staff Network, which happens on the second Wednesday of every May and will be on the 8th of May in 2024. But what Sharon talks about and leading the editorial production of this year's theme is saluting our uh, sisters. Uh, it's a focus on black women this year, um, about time too. And the overarching uh, theme is we matter. And that's a pushback against some of the war on woke and the war on uh, uh, culture wars around uh, black lives matter. But I think that Black History Month is a wonderful opportunity to um, increase uh, a focused attention on those contributions, just as other uh, protected characteristics now have a period in the year um, where, whether it's June and Pride, whether it's, you know, um, uh, the National Week for Inclusion, which uh, kicks off uh, yes, next week. <laughs> I think these are wonderful opportunities to bring to the fore of people's minds those lesser known facts, but the current practice around delivering on equity and inclusion. And so I welcome it in that sense. Of course, I'm black every day of the year, mm -hmm. as are many other members of our black community. And we know that the lived experience, some of it, the turbulence, um, is something we deal with every uh, day of the year. But Black History Month is an opportunity for us all to come together and uh, really promote those lesser known facts and acknowledge uh, certainly where it came from, um, and what it is we're doing each time, uh, each October here in the UK around Black History. Thank you, Rob. Really loved hearing those thoughts. And thank you so much for your You're time. Welcome. I have loved, absolutely loved this conversation. It's been fascinating. Um, yeah, I just like peering into your brain. So, um, yeah, just want to say a huge thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, if people want to get in touch with you, all the information will be in the show notes. This is such a fascinating interview for me. I've seen Rob speak and I've known him for a while, but it was just fantastic to go back over his career and understand just how long um, he's been involved in really fighting for race, equity, race, equality. Um, and I was particularly um, 
interested in the discussion we had around some of the more structural elements of inclusion and, and his perspective on uh, recent reports reporting that there's no such thing as um, uh, institutional racism in, in the UK and you know his his analogy around it's not a single rotten apple in the barrel it's the barrel that's rotten really really struck home for me and I thought it was a very good way of thinking about uh, some of the rhetoric that we're hearing these days. The other thing that struck me about Rob aside from his passion and his eloquence is his phenomenal memory and I said this to him when we weren't recording. Um, I'm deeply envious of his ability to recall people and places and dates and what I really love is uh, the way he really celebrates and recognises the role that other people have had and, and names those people so that he's not just taking the, the plaudits for himself but actually recognising the role that others have had and sharing that uh, as part of this recording so you can all hear what amazing work other people are doing too. This podcast is brought to you by Liberare Consulting, with editing provided by Hawkins Social. If you enjoyed today's episode, why not click on the subscribe button so you are the first to hear about new episodes. We look forward to welcoming you back soon.